issues, which um, seems to be something we could have avoided, but uh, since we didn't have that, let's just move on. Uh, we're 15 minutes late. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, but um, we have Justin here from California. Is that right? Oakland, California, right? Yes. Um, yes, that is correct. Right. And um, it's early morning over there, and I really am uh, thankful to Justin and Katia from SciArc who have joined us um, all the way from California, across the world, literally. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about preservation. Justin works with the SciArc Foundation. He's the chief technology evangelist there. And um, he's going to talk about this really cool organization which does some excellent, incredible stuff with technology, but they will, I mean, he, he will also talk about preservation in general before moving on to the more specific talk, topic about technology in, present, in preservation. So without much ado, let's start. Uh, Justin, I hand over the uh, stage to you. Um, <laughs> right, so I see more people joining. Let me uh, do something which will uh, not interrupt you. Give me one second. Okay. Um, Hi everyone. Um, sorry about Hi. the delay. Um, that's Devika. I know her from a while back. Glad you joined, Devika. Um, I'm muting everybody who joins from now on so that Justin is not interrupted. As uh, I mentioned, we will take questions here. Uh, well, there is a chat window here, and uh, we already have our Facebook page. We have the Go UNESCO Campus Ambassador Facebook page, and we also have uh, the Google Plus page. So it's hard to keep track of all the social media, but <laughs> here we are. Oh, uh, just a small announcement, um, not really announcement, but a small recap of what is happening with the Go UNESCO Campus Ambassador program. Um, we started the second session in June 1st, starting June 1st, and we have more than 300 students from 30 different countries participating this year, this session. And um, I, I'm, I'm pretty glad that all these people have uh, uh, believed in the idea that um, heritage is important and are trying to see how we can, or rather helping us make heritage fun, which is, I think, critical to preservation also without it being interesting. Why would anybody want to preserve it? Uh, but um, so the first, uh, so they do a, a bunch of things. So they are all called tasks. They have two weeks to complete a task and then um, uh, submit their task. The first one was called Go UNESCO Selfie, in which all these uh, uh, students from across the world went to a heritage location next to their, or in their city, and got a selfie taken and then posted it on the internet. Um, it, it's not just uh, building awareness to the campus ambassador themselves, but also to their friends when they post it on social media. Uh, but moving on, we have more interesting stuff today, very exciting stuff. I'm really excited that Justin is here. Uh, so Justin, on to you. I'll be on mute, um, so you can. Um, okay. I'll be available, but mute and invisible, <laughs> so that uh, I don't interrupt you. But uh, okay. thank you and start, please. All right. Thank yeah. you, everyone who who is uh, watching and, and joined our our broadcast. Um, uh, as AJ mentioned, I'm from SciArc. We're, we're based over in California. Um, however, we're a, a small nonprofit, but we have a global mission, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, um, and some technology that, that we use. So uh, just to give you a little background on myself, I am actually an archaeologist, so even though I'm going to be talking to you today about a lot of uh, advanced technology and its applications to cultural heritage, uh, my background is actually very specialized in using these technologies for archaeological purposes, so um, please feel free in the, the Q&A session at the end. Um, you know. Feel free to ask me the tough tech questions. I, I've been working with this technology for almost 10 years, so I do know it inside and out. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and switch over now to my PowerPoint um, so that you can uh, follow along. So just one moment as I set up the screen share here. Um, OK, it should be, should be sharing now for you, the, the heritage preservation. If, if that's not up, somebody feel free to jump in and, and, and let me know. But um, I've, I've switched over to that now. It's good, uh, uh, Justin. We can. Great, see. perfect. Thank you. I can't. I can't see both screens. It's on the on the Hangout. So thank you. Um, so we're yeah. We're like I said. We're going to talk about heritage preservation and and technology today. Um, 
one of the, 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 the key things to cultural heritage preservation is always documentation. Um, documentation is really key to any good conservation because before you can conserve a site and manage the site, you actually need to know what you have, right? You need to know what you have there in order to conserve it. And the best way to do that is to have a systematic, holistic documentation um, of the property um, or the artifact or, or, or whatever it is that you're trying to conserve. So documentation is, is really key to good conservation. Um, and that's really how uh, the technologies we're going to talk about today will really play in into the whole preservation component. So traditional documentation for uh, heritage site and archaeologist um, is very much uh, was done you know with, with by hand with a clipboard and pencil, um, tape and tape measure and, and measured strings or chains. Um, and you know people would go out and spend hours. Um, like these gentlemen in these, these historic photographs um, taking hand measurements and, and writing everything down uh, and hoping that there were no mistakes and that when they went back to their um, studios and they, they drew out their plans and, and elevations, all their measurements added up and lines actually connected, um, which wasn't always the case and they'd have to go and visit again. Um, this is very tedious, um, prone to error, um, unless you were highly skilled and very experienced. Now. I do say that this is a traditional, of course, I'm, I'm showing some photographs from um, about the 1930s or 40s here in the United States, but um, these technologies are still widely used, particularly by archaeologists. Um, as as uh, any archaeologist or heritage professional will tell you, um, the heritage industry is always underfunded, so having access to the latest and greatest uh, isn't always a possibility. Um, that's me there on the, on the far left in grad school uh, using uh, planning board, so it's a one meter by one meter square, a planning frame, uh, one meter square frame with uh, strings running through it, cutting it into 10 centimeter sections, uh, and using that as the guide to draw uh, the plan of these uh, foundation stones from a 19th century folly in England. Um, or over on the right there, some of my friends in very muddy, very wet England, um, and you can see the tape measures lying at their feet as, as they're also taking you know, measurements of, of their excavations and, and recording that they have. So this technology is, you know, uh, still very much in use, um, uh, these traditional methods. However, more and more um, being, being integrated into that is, you know, slightly modern stuff, uh, um, particularly total stations uh, and GPS uh, survey equipment. So these allow us to then begin taking remote um, points of measurement, but at a very, very high precision. So if you're not familiar with the total station, which is that device there on the tripod, um, it uh, uses a laser. It sends out a single laser pulse. The, the, the operator points it in the right direction from the object they want to take a measurement of. Um, and uh, its uh, internal calibration is extremely precise so that you're getting measurements um, easily accurate to you know about a millimeter or so. So for example, on the uh, bridge there, you might be able to come in and, and take, you know, 50 points across the bridge over the course of a couple hours in the afternoon, um, and that could be provide you the base information to draw your elevation. Um, it could also be used for things like um, monitoring. So uh, known points can be set up around the bridge that the station, the base, the total station gets set up at um, uh, repeatedly, you know, maybe every year or every six months or something like that at a, at a set interval of time. And by setting up always over that known point um, and measuring the exact same points on the bridge or, or other structure, you can actually begin to monitor for you know, movement and settlement and things like that. And so that's used a lot for, for monitoring um, for sites where there are concerns of, of you know, uh, damage or, or structural movement um, that could result in damage. Um, so you know, these total stations and things are, are, are very, very, very precise. And in GPS now, Again, GPS can range from handheld devices that are accurate to within a few meters um, to something called differential GPS, which uh, you might see surveyors out on sites with, and it's usually sort of a large round disc the size of a plate, um, you know, that might be sitting on top of a total station or on top Justin, of a plate. Yes. Sorry, sorry to bother you, but uh, yeah. we're still I can still just slide one for some reason. It hasn't um, moved from the screen. It's still okay. on heritage preservation and technology. Oh, mm, that's not good. Okay. Yeah, I, what if? What if? Everyone has this. Now it's changed. Now it just changed. 
Okay, you know what? I think, um, sorry about that. I think it doesn't like it when I have the presentation in presentation mode. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll leave it in, in the preview mode. Um, so I'm just going to back up a little bit. Here's okay. some photographs of the uh, you know traditional survey um, that I was just discussing. Um, and then you know here are some photographs of archaeologists still using these types of hand measurements and, and hand tools today. Um, and then here we have uh, using um, some total station systems um, on, on a site. So those are changing, right, as I'm, as I'm clicking through. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, cool. it is. Great. Thank you for that, um, bringing that to my attention. So, no problem. <laughs> Uh, so as I was saying, the you know total stations and, and the differential GPS now, differential GPS uh, gives much higher precision than you know the GPS in a cell phone or in a car uh, or other handheld devices. It can actually capture down to you know um, uh, half a centimeter or centimeter um, type of data, depending on how many satellites it can communicate with. So again, you can get very precise information um, in terms of geolocation that can be tied in with the total station, so that you know. All those total station measurements that you're taking can be geolocated to within, you know, a centimeter or so on the globe. Um, so you know, we can we can really start to capture really precise information, uh, especially compared to uh, more traditional methods with the with the tape measures. Um, in addition to that, um, there are even you know newer, more state of the art technology. And that's going to be sort of a large focus of, of what SciArc does, um, what we're going to talk about, and specifically. LIDAR, which stands for light detection and ranging. Now, there are different types of LIDAR systems. There are aerial LIDAR systems, which get mounted into the base of a plane, and they can fly over a landscape. They tend to capture a few measurements per square meter. Um, there are uh, mobile systems that you can mount to a vehicle and drive around, and they tend to capture a few points per centimeter. Um, however, the primary system that uh, SIRC uses in order to capture high detail uh, historic sites and, and archaeological remains um, are these terrestrial based ones like the one we see um, next to the, the lady here uh, in Mexico on, on, sitting on the tripod. Um, additionally, which these kinds of systems can capture points every you know couple of millimeters um, so we get very very dense information. Um, we also use photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is a, is a method of, of capturing 3D data from photographs. I'm going to explain that a little further um, in the presentation. And then, of course, drones, um, where uh, small uh, remote controlled uh, aerial devices are, are being used to capture landscapes and structures. Um, and these tools, uh, whereas the, the total station or the GPS can take single measurements at a time, to traditional surveying with a total station, you might be able to capture, you know, somewhere between 300 and 500 points in a single day, um, depending on how experienced you are or, or what the job is. Um, however, uh, a laser scanner, um, you know, on the, on the low end in terms of, of speed, they capture about 50,000 points a second. Um, and on the high end of speed, they capture about 1.1 million points a second. Now, each machine has its strengths and weaknesses. The ones that go slower have longer distances, for example. Um, but that's, uh, you know, so we're, we're capturing very precise information uh, very, very quickly um, with these types of technology. Um, so to elaborate on, on each one a little further, now there's actually a video for the LiDAR and the photogrammetry slides I'm going to show you. Uh, AJ and I did a test, unfortunately, the streaming the video from my laptop through Google Hangouts to yours doesn't quite work. Uh, it doesn't like to stream video from video. Um, so we provided a link uh, to download the presentation and those two videos. So please feel free to watch them um, uh, at your own uh, on your own time. Um, but I'll I'll explain the explain them through the graphics here. Um, so the lidar system to get a little more technical. Basically, what it's doing, very similar to the total station, it's shooting out a laser uh, and taking a measurement. Uh, but it's got a rotating mirror in the middle um, that is allowing it to pulse out those those um, those laser pulses automatically, um, about 50,000 to a million points a second, as I mentioned, depending on your machine. Um, and it, it what it does is is as the laser spins um, in the vertical axis. Um, you can kind of see in the, on the machine on the tripod there, there's 
sort of like a slot in the middle. Um, that's where the, the laser light is coming out of, and it's sort of spinning on that vertical axis. Um, and then it, uh, the machine also rotates in the horizontal axis, so it just basically sweeps across a scene, capturing everything it can see in the full 360 degree, um, you know, sphere, uh, sphere of information. Um, and it's taking all those measurements um, to the, you know, within the specs of the machine. Um, this machine, for example, here shown by Leica, this is one of the ones that can only capture about 50,000 points a second, but it can capture data up to 300 meters away, whereas the machines that capture a million points a second tend to be capped around, you know, maybe 75 meters or so. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, the different speeds will affect uh, other capacities. So they're, it's capturing lots of information. You can see in this, this graphic, you know, the left side, these sort of um, hypercolor of, of orange and yellow um, is what comes back from the scene. Um, and although that looks solid, it's literally just millions of points representing the surface. Every single one of those points is a measurement in 3D space. Um, and the colors are uh, something the scanner natively reads. Uh, it's actually the, um, it's the reflectance value of the light. So basically what it's doing is the laser not only measures the distance of the object, it also measures the percentage of light that bounces back from the object. Um, it just records this as, as secondary information, but sometimes that information is useful. Sometimes we can actually use that information to identify different types of stones, um, possibly things like water damage, where, where damp wet stones will absorb more light than dry stones. So uh, uh, occasionally, we're actually able to use that reflectance information to to aid the conservation work, um, in in order to um, further inform the conservators of different things that are happening or the different types of materials um, that the structure might be created out of. Um, so again, it's just uh, you know it's sending out a light. The light hits the object, bounces back. It takes that measurement of distance and, and reflectance. Um, and that's the, the standard principle for, for all LiDAR systems. Um, then photogrammetry, um, which is photo-based modeling. So this can actually get much higher resolution than a laser scanner. However, the um, issue with, photo with photogrammetry is it's not scaled. So it's not natively measurable, right? So a photograph um, doesn't you know, have any information of what the size of the object is because the LiDAR system is actually taking measurements. Um, it's a scaled system. You can you can you can measure it. You know you can put it into um, architectural CAD software so that you can create your elevations or plans and other measured information. Photogrammetry, however, um, isn't natively scaled, but it can be scaled. You can you can do lots of things by adding a scale bar to what you're photographing, for example, to create the scale within the image. Um, additionally, you can combine photogrammetry with lidar, where you use the LiDAR, um, or even uh, a few key points from the total station, um, and you use that measured information to scale the, the photograph. But basically what happens with photographic photogrammetry and what's being represented in this graphic sort of abstractly, but uh, might make some more sense what we're looking at here, is um, photogrammetry is taking many, many overlapping photographs. So what we're seeing sort of on the, on the right side of this image, the, the sort of white and stuff, it's actually... Um, um, a dam in, in Alaska. It's a historic dam. And uh, what you're seeing there, you can see it looks like lots of different planes of images um, intersecting. Uh, and then the red is actually all of the um, little camera graphics representing where the camera images were taken. So what we do with photogrammetry is we take a vast sequence of photographs of overlapping information. Then the software that we um, uh, run the images through, um, can back calculate where all those images were taken from, from the overlap in the images. Um, and then from there, we generate the 3D structure. Um, so as long as you have, you know, good lighting conditions and you're able to see everything, you can create a very, very high resolution um, uh, photogrammetric model. And theoretically, the resolution on photogrammetry is endless. Um, you can get higher resolution by putting, you know, zooming into the object and just taking more pictures instead of, you know, capturing the whole surface in a photograph. Maybe you capture the surface um, with 50 photographs um, that are that are zoomed in and, and a higher resolution. So you're capturing more of that grain in detail. Um, I've used photogrammetry to 
see the um, individual sand grains on a sandstone structure actually in, in India. Um, I'm going to talk about that site at the very end. Um, it's called Rani Kivav and it's in Gujarat. Um, and uh, I, I did some photogrammetry where I took about a hundred photos of a small structure, a small statue, no more than you know um, half a meter tall. Um, so the, the resolution on it was so fine that I could actually start to see the individual sand grains in the sandstone. Um, so it, it, it can be very powerful. It's particularly wonderful for small objects. Um, uh, uh, it's used a lot um, in, in, in capturing artifacts for, for museums, for virtual displays or 3D printing of artifacts and replicas, uh, things like that. Um, because it tends to be a little less expensive than the scanning, but, you know, all you need is a camera and a little bit of software versus this very highly um, you know, expensive specialized scanning hardware, um, but gives you great resolution on, on small objects. Um, and additionally, what's becoming more and more frequent in, in heritage applications in just the last you know, year or two is the application of drones. Um, so we've used this now on a couple of sites. This is uh, some gentleman from the from the Taos Pueblo um, um, Native American site in in uh, New Mexico, and it's uh, one of the oldest continuously inhabited um, uh, communities in in North America. It's been inhabited for at least a thousand years. It's a very traditional site, uh, no running water, no electricity, and it's all earthwork, adobe, uh, mud brick structures. And uh, we were out there scanning the, 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 the village, the Pueblo, um, and we uh, needed to map the roofs of the structures and get the, the surrounding landscape. The, the village is, sits at the base of a mountain. Um, the mountain was believed to be sacred, so the landscape is, is very you know, culturally relevant to the, to the history of the location. Um, so we flew one of these small drones. Um, it's very easy. We, basically, we mount a small camera onto it. Um, this drone in particular uh, communicates with a laptop that is connected to Google Earth. We draw a polygon in Google Earth of the, the area that we want mapped. Um, the software then communicates that to the drone, um, and the drone, um, once we launch it, um, which is literally just a few, um, uh, basically you, you turn the propeller on and, and toss it forward and it takes right off, uh, and uh, it then flies up and, and automatically maps um, the area that you've, you've drawn in your um, polygon. On, on Google Earth. Now, different drones work differently. Some of them are remote controlled, um, so a user is controlling them, um, so they're not as automated. Um, they, they, they range in, you know, price from these small remote controlled ones, you know, um, and, and for maybe a thousand dollars or so to, you know, uh, several times that for these very fancy ones that get uh, very automated uh, in their processing. And so basically what it's doing is it's capturing photographs or in some cases video um, and then it's using the photogrammetry method. It's just we're using the same type of software. It's taking those photographs or individual frames from the video um, as images and reconstructing the topography in the landscape from the air. Um, now there are current efforts to map uh, to to map with drones using the lidar system, some of the um, smaller laser scanners. However. Um, they're not quite perfected. Uh, getting the scanner onto the drone, they're, they're, um, uh, originally there were weight issues, but the scanners have gotten smaller, and now people have successfully made drones strong enough to lift the scanners, the smaller scanners, uh, but now there's a lot of issues with the, the constant vibration and, and, and movement of the drone um, means that the uh, position um, of the scanner is constantly changing, so the software has to correct that in terms of when it's taking that measurement of the laser shooting out from the scanner and coming back. Um, that typically requires the, the machine to stand still, so if you're moving the machine, then you have to have all these other um, components in the software to compensate for that. So um, right now it's more of a software issue in terms of getting uh, effective um, LiDAR systems on drones, but I'm sure, like everything, that will be addressed by brilliant software engineers in, in just a few years. Um, so pretty soon we'll have these, these small drones with small laser scanners on them. Um, so, so those are a lot of the you know, primary technologies we're using. We actually you know, use them very closely together. As I mentioned, 
we can use the laser scanning and the total station to provide the scale and control for the photogrammetry. We also use the GPS in the total station to provide um, similar um, georeferencing uh, information for the laser scanner. So here, this photograph, we've got a laser scanner on the right side scanning this um, earthen uh, adobe mud brick structure in, in Central Asia. It's a, it's a large ice house. It's this sort of large conical um, dome structure that was used to store ice in, in the deserts um, of, of Turkmenistan and Central Asia. Um, and the gentleman on the left is behind one of the total stations, which you can see has this little round um, hat sitting on top of it, which is the differential GPS. So he's taking measurements of, of a few key components of the structure. Um, with the total station, which is communicating to the GPS, so we're actually gathering those measurements to within a, um, about. Uh, for this project, we had enough satellites that we were getting about five to seven millimeter uh, accuracy on our positions. So every measurement he was taking was within, you know, roughly half a centimeter to a centimeter of of accuracy in, in a known point on the planet. Um, and then we were using those same points were obviously being captured by the millions of points that we were taking with laser scanner. And in the software, we can go back into the laser scan data and we can assign um, that same information back to those known points. We can say, we know this point, we know it's geo-coordinate, uh, and do that for all those measured points, and then it geo-references uh, the whole data set. Um, so everything gets shifted to its, its um, real-world coordinate system in, in that way so that we know exactly where the structure sits, um, this whole massive structure, you know, within, within half a centimeter, uh, which, is, which is pretty impressive. It's a fantastic way to um, combine the different technologies. Um, and again, uh, you know, that was used to, to create better conservation um, um, for this specific site, which was having, um, you can probably tell, I'm photographing through a, a hole in the wall, it's having some conservation concerns uh, as parts of the structure are collapsing. Um, so, you know, what does SciArc do and with all these technologies? How do we utilize them? How do we bring them to, to heritage? Um, and, you know, why do we do it? What is the story of our founding? Um, what, what is the purpose of our mission? I, I want to talk a little bit about that now. And, and, how these technologies come into play for us. Um, we were founded uh, in the early 2000s. We were officially established as a nonprofit um, in 2003. Um, and that came um, after um, 2001 when the, the, Buddhas uh, the Buddhas in Bamiyan Valley in Afghanistan were destroyed um, by the Taliban. Our founder actually developed the first commercially available laser scanning and software system. Uh, he was a civil engineer. Um, he had sent out many teams with those tape measures to, to survey um, engineering and construction sites and power plants and things like that, and was just uh, unsatisfied with the, the time and effort and error in them, um, and uh, developed a technology company to solve you know, the problem. Um, what became the 3D laser scanning system. Um, scanning systems technically existed before this, but they were largely bespoke um, research projects and university laboratories. They were not something that was uh, commercialized for the market. So that's what he developed. He developed this holistic system of hardware and software and, and brought it to market to sell to engineering and surveying firms. Um, he then sold that off to Lyco Geosystems, who um, we've you know, seen the, the photograph there, the graphic earlier of the scanner, uh, which is from them. Um, which is the, you know, the sort of predecessor, uh, not the predecessor, the, uh, the follow-up devices to the ones he developed in the late 90s. Um, and uh, when the Taliban destroyed the, the Bamiyan Buddhas, um, our founder and his wife you know, were watching the news about this devastation. Um, he had always had a great love of history. His father was a, a scholar. Uh, he's natively born in Iraq, and so he grew up visiting sites like Babylon and Nineveh in Mesopotamia, you know, these, these amazing, you know, um, early civilizations. Um, so despite being an engineer, always had a great passion for history. And when this happened, um, you know, he thought, well, what if we had scanned them beforehand? Perhaps that data could be used for the reconstruction to rebuild the pieces, um, or even just to re-carve them out of the out of the stone. 
Um, you know, it's metrically accurate information. It, it could have been helpful. Um, and so that was the genesis of, of SciArt. So then we were founded as an organization to sort of research this agenda. Um, and so the first five years or so, it was a, a lot of early um, efforts with, with archaeologists and conservators to figure out how to really apply this technology for their work um, and make it useful and, and teach them about it um, and learn their specific needs. Um, so uh, you know, those, those first years were, were a great deal of effort of, of trying to understand that application. Um, and uh, now we've been around for about 11 years um, and have continued to grow in, in, in our efforts and our, in our capacity. And of course we do it because um, as, as our, our founder truly believes is, you know, the, the, these structures, these heritage sites, um, they are sort of the physical representations of our, of our human heritage and, and our heritage is, you know, our, our collective memory of who we were, where we've come from. Um, and therefore, it's our responsibility to protect them for, for future generations to um, save that story of our ancestry uh, and our past um, um, for our children and grandchildren and, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, to, to learn about um, our origins. So, but that's no small task. Um, you know, not only uh, are there issues of, of human conflict and and uh, destruction, like the Taliban uh, destroying the Buddhas, but you know there are many other threats to heritage. There are natural disasters, from uh, you know earthquakes and rising sea levels and, and tornadoes and, and everything else. Um, deterioration from the simple natural weathering of time, um, which is also accelerated in in many locations due to things like acid rain caused from uh, human pollution, um, human caused pollution. Uh, to, you know, urban, uh, urban sprawl and, and, and various other issues. So there's uh, a huge, a huge threat um, to, to heritage. So we need to try to protect as much of it as we can, as quickly as we can, before these things you know occur. Before um, war breaks out and uh, site is destroyed. Before the next big earthquake hits and levels a building. Um, before the acid rain slowly further erodes the structures. Um, but that's no small task. Right, there are. This number is a little old for the UNESCO heritage sites. As uh, just in the last week or so, they've added further. Um, I think another 20. So I think we're over a thousand UNESCO sites now, um, and uh, you know, a hundred of those are considered at risk um, and threatened. So 10 percent um, are 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 heavily uh, are threatened. You know, India itself has over 3,600 ancient monuments cataloged by the Archaeological Survey of India. The Smithsonian Museum in the United States has over 137 million objects in its collection. Um, so the, the challenge is, is vast. Um, it's massive. There's so much to do. Um, and that is why we feel that the, the speed um, and uh, capacity of these new technologies, that they really provide us the advancements needed um, to um, address this challenge, to, to take it on. Um, so uh, our mission, you know, as an organization is therefore to, really we want to create a paradigm shift. We want to change the way conservators uh, and archaeological site managers uh, and their interpretive rangers and staff uh, think about the site, think about how to conserve and protect the site, think about how to educate the public about the site. We want to change all of them. Um, and we really want to do that through the use of technologies. We want to make these technologies ubiquitous in conservation and, and cultural heritage, not a, a fringe technology that gets used for the best sites and the, or, or the most well-funded sites, um, but something that becomes widely accepted as the method to be used. Um, and uh, help spread that, uh, not only the, the technology and, and how it can help, but also the capacity to, to use it. Um, and we really do believe in a, a very holistic approach. Um, we call it digital preservation. Um, there's a nice little graph there on the right. Um, you know, we, we start off with the field data collection, the, the photogrammetry, the laser scanning, the photography, the GPS survey, all of that data collection on site. 
Um, then we funnel that data. My colleague Katya, who, who's uh, visiting this this presentation this morning, does a lot of this work for us. We, you know, we funnel this the, the, the data into basically two pipelines, um, one for conservation. So that's where we usually work with the site authorities, the conservators, to create tools for them from the data for actual conservation needs. Those maybe be um, architectural drawings or seismic stability, um, you know, uh, tests, uh, and that kind of um, you know, engineering conservation type of application. And the other thing is dissemination and, and education. This technology creates d um, data that is, you know, it's called born digital. You know, it's already digital. We don't have to then go back and um, uh, put a bunch of old documents into a flatbed scanner to create images from it. Like, it's digital to begin with, which means it's extremely easy for us to take that data and begin to use it in all kinds of um, uh, new outreach mechanisms, the internet, mobile devices, and all these other things. Um, and then as an organization, our, our long-term our mission is to uh, archive that data. We actually have a, a very robust archive. We have multiple tiers of, of archiving information from a 2,000 terabyte um, system sitting in our, our, on our office um, that has uh, tape drives being backing up the whole thing every uh, every couple of weeks and then the new the new backups every couple of weeks go off to a um, sort of actually go off into to two locations one another San Francisco Bay Area location that's offsite from from our office if they're not in the same building we are a seismically active area um, we're in a tall office building things like fires could happen so we don't want to keep the only copy there. Um, additionally, a second copy goes into what we consider sort of our our gold standard archive. Um, it's our, our our best archive. It uh, all goes off to an underground bunker in the mountains of Pennsylvania on the east coast of the United States. And it's actually a nuclear safe bunker at the base inside a mountain. Uh, it is heavily secured uh, and heavily protected. Um, and we have all kinds of plans in place for data migration so that the data doesn't fall into obsolescence from uh, file format types or media storage types. So you know we have uh, um, strong technology partners that specialize in archiving that help us address these issues. Um, and so far to date, in the in the ten years we've been around, we've managed to do um, over 130 heritage sites from Babylon and Iraq and Easter Island to. Um, Pisa, uh, Thebes in Egypt, Mount Rushmore, um, and as I mentioned, Rani uh, Kivab. Sorry, there's a typo there on the on the presentation. It's Rani Kivab uh, in in India. Um, so you know, 130 sites, and we've actually managed to com cover all seven continents. Yes, we actually have data from Antarctica. We have data from some of the early um, South Pole exploration missions uh, of the turn of the last century, um, and some of their um, sort of base camp huts that they built uh, near the shorelines of, of Antarctica have been scanned. Um, so we do have data from all seven continents, which is which is I think pretty pretty awesome. Um, and so. What do we do with the data once we collect it, right? Well, um, we have a, a vast global audience. Um, we use that data to tell the story. One of the great things we're able to do is, is create mobile apps. As I mentioned, the data is born digital, so it becomes very easy as for to put it into a mobile app for your, for your cell phone or your tablet or to put it on the internet. Um, we use it to create interactive lesson plans um, with uh, students. So here, for example, we have a student that's using an interactive classroom whiteboard called a smart board. Um, it actually has a, a projector. Uh, the board itself is uh, like a touch screen. You can, you can touch it and interact with the objects on it. And the student here is, is working with a 3D model um, of Mount Rushmore in the United States. So here you can see he, he's basically poking our first president, George Washington, in the eye. Um, but the interactive smart board allows him to, to do this, to rotate the model. Um, view it from different angles. Uh, he can actually take measurements of it so they can learn about the scale and size of the mountain. This structure is massive. Uh, George Washington head there is roughly 60 feet tall. His tw uh, so uh, what's that? About 20 meters, a um, uh, little less than 20 meters tall. So uh, you know it's a huge it's a huge structure. And they, they the student in this particular is located in the state of South Dakota where the mountain um, sits. And so he's learning about his state history uh, and getting to learn about the, the carving of the mountain and the engineering and the sculpture process that went into that. So it becomes a, 
a not only interactive education but a cross-disciplinary education. You've got the math and science or the carving of a whole mountain um, inter interspersed with the the designs and the um, scale and perspective um, concepts of the, the, the sculpture and the, the artist who designed the mountain uh, sculpture. So it becomes a, a interdisciplinary education tool um, and interactive and, and digital for these students. Um, we have fun interactive uh, educational activities online where students get to interact with the data. This one shows an example where uh, they use one of the Spanish colonial um, missions in, in Texas um, and they learn about architecture. They learn about not only the colonial style of architecture from that period, but they also learn about you know um, architecture or all uh, designs and, and engineering components. So here they're learning about arches um, and you know a keystone at the top of the arch and how that you know the arch is a, a, is a, is a strong design, etc. Uh, and they actually have to rotate and move these individual stone blocks from the um, front door church arch uh, and rebuild it. Um, uh, so they, they, they're again you know learning about the history while at the same time uh, learning some some architecture and engineering component all in one and it's a little online activity for, for students. Um, and it's free. Anybody can access this stuff on our website. Um, virtual tours, not only do we do laser scanning, but we do a lot of um, high resolution panoramic photography. Um, and we use that to, to allow people to virtually access and, and virtually tour the sites. Um, we can incorporate text, we can incorporate audio. So if the site has uh, you know, an audio tour that already exists,